Hey guys, welcome to the fifth episode of Schwartz Bitch by Shorty. This one's about nucleic acid synthesis and function inhibitors. So let's get started. Hopefully, this will be a lot shorter than the other one, because there's only like three types of drugs we're talking about. Okay, so the way that quinolones or fl or fl <clears throat> or fluoroquinolones work is that they target topoisomerase 2, which includes DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4, or topo 4. And topo 2 regulates the coiling of bacterial DNA. Um, specifically, DNA gyrase is involved in winding and unwinding DNA, and topo 4 is involved in decatenating, or untying, two circular chromosomes after replication. So, in image form, here is your DNA gyrase DNA and DNA gyrase complex. So you have DNA right here, gyrase right here, and replicating DNA is what's happening in this picture. So the original two strands of DNA are being replicated here, and gyrase is winding and unwinding DNA so that replication can happen. And importantly, the tyrosine residue of each gyrase is involved in holding the DNA together, holding the DNA to unwind and unwind, wind and unwind it. So G gyrase, DNA gyrase is attached to DNA by the tyrosine residue residue of gyrate DNA gyrase. And what cipro or what fluoroquinolones do is that they um push the bases apart at the cut site. So here's the cut site, and here's the fluoroquinolone pushing the bases or the different DNA apart. And this prevents um, DNA from re-ligating, and this also prevents DNA from being released from gyrase. So, basically what ciprofloxacin, or like any fluoro fluoro fluoroquinolone does, is that they bind to the DNA gyrase uh, DNA complex, a covalent complex, and they push the bases apart at the cut site. So here's a cut site. This is where the DNA was cut. And this prevents the DNA from coming together or re-ligating. And this prevents DNA from being released from the enzyme. I'll put this in word form for you right here. So, they bind to the DNA-DNA gyrus complex. Number two, they push the bases apart. And number three, this prevents re-ligation and this prevents DNA, DNA release. <coughs> and another important thing is that they interact with both the DNA and the protein DNA gyrase directly. They don't interact with only DNA or only interact with only the DNA gyrase. They interact with the whole complex, the DNA, DNA gyrus complex. And other no notable thing, there's two tyrosines per two molecules of drugs. So there's two molecules of DNA, two molecules of tyrosine, two molecules of DNA gyrase, and two molecules of drug. So the way that fluoroquinolones can selectively target bacterial topo-2 is that humans also have a topoisomerase, which is labeled H-topo-2. And this enzyme is different enough in the structure so that the quinolones don't recognize it and don't bind to the structure. And when they can't bind to the structure, they can't inhibit nucleo nucleic acid synthesis and DNA re-ligation. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the structure activity relationships of the fluoroquinolones. So first off, okay, so I'll go generally, and then I'll go to each one of the examples he provides, and then show you how the structure activity relationships um, apply to each of those drugs. So first off, the fluorine. So the carbon-6, at carbon-6 over here, carbon-6, you have a fluorine attached, which increases the lipophilicity. And if you saw my last video, you know that increase in the lipo lipophilicity increases the absorption of the drug. Um, over here, our carbon seven, carbon seven. If you add a paparazine ring, I didn't write that. 
And mm, man. Okay. And the paparazine ring is the one in yellow. Mm, man. So right here is the paparazine ring. Paparazine. So basically if you add a paparazine ring at the carbon seven, carbon seven's right here, you broaden the spectrum of acti activity. However, if you add this paparazine ring, you also enable the molecule to act on GABA receptors in the central nervous system, which leads to central nervous system side effects. However, you, however, you can decrease these side effects by adding methyl or ethyl groups at over here at R2, R3, or you can add bulky groups at R1. So if you add methyl or ethyl groups right here at R2, R3, or if you add bulky groups right here at R1, you can decrease the CNS side effects by decreasing the effect on GABA receptors from this paparazine ring. Um, and this X over here, if this X is a nitrogen, then you increase bioavailability, which is F. Don't get that F mixed up with the fluorine right here. This F on the right corresponds to bioavailability, not fluorine. So if you add a nitrogen here, you increase the bioavailability of the fluoroquinolone. So now let's apply that structure activity relationship to these molecules. So, um, as I said, is there an F? Oh man, I missed the fluorine. Um, yeah, so there's a fluorine right there. Okay, so adding an F, what does adding in fluorine do? That increases the bioavailability. So norfloxacin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin have increased lipophilicity because of the fluorine groups. Um, let's see, what else did I say? Adding the paparazine ring at carbon 7, so here is, let's zoom in. So here is carbon 7 in each of the molecules. Here's carbon, carbon 7, carbon 7, carbon 7, carbon 7, which is right under carbon 6 where the fluorine attaches. So our carbon 7, if you add a paparazine ring, which is a nitrogen, dinitrogen ring, dinitrogen ring, dinitrogen ring, dinitrogen ring, which looks like a paparazine from a molecular stand or a pep, uh, protein standpoint. If you add a paparazine at carbon 7, you get an increased spectrum of activity. However, if you, while increasing the spectrum of activity, activity you increase target binding at GABA receptors, which increases CNS side effects. So, the way you can do that is by adding methyl or ethyl groups at the left side of the molecule. So if you see the left side of the molecule at the R2 and R3 position, if you see methyl or ethyl groups, you can decrease the GABA receptor binding, which decreases CNS side effects. So let's look at these molecules. None here in the lower fluoxacin because it's only a second generation. Cipro, not really because it's a second generation. Uh, Levofloxacin, you have a methyl group here. Um, so, remember if you add a methyl group to the left side of the molecule, you decrease GABA binding and decrease CNS side effects. This kind of, and moxifloxacin, this kind of represents methyl or ethyl groups. Because you have a methyl right here and ethyl right here. Adding that decreases the CNS side effects. Um, now let's look at the other way you can decrease CNS side effects. I also said you can add bulky groups at the R1 position which is over here at the bottom of the molecule. So left side of the molecule, adding an ethyl and a methyl group. Bottom of the molecule at the R1, adding a bulky group, decreases CNS side effects. Um, so for example, norfloxacin, some bulky group at the bottom. Ciprofloxacin, some bulky group at the bottom. Levofloxacin, really bulky group at the bottom. Moxifloxacin, bulky group at the bottom. That decreases CNS side effects because you also have the paparazine ring at C carbon 7, which is right below carbon 6, which has what? 
the fluorines. Carbon-6 has fluorines. Um, what else did I say? Okay, last thing, I think. I also said that um, if you make X a nitrogen, or any basically any withdrawal, like electron withdrawing group like, group like oxygen, you can increase the bioavailability. Um, oh, cool thing. So adding a fluorine here increases the bioavailability of the lipophilicity. Adding a nitrogen here increases the F. So basically F, so F here, F here, both mean bioavail increasing in bioavailability. But don't get that mixed up because the left F means fluorine and this F means bioavailability. Either way, more Fs means more bioavailability. But over here, you want to make an N, not an F. Hope you get that. If you don't, let me know. Um, let's see, what was I got? Oh, yeah. Making that bottom... Okay, let's go back. Making that bottom X a nitrogen or an electron withdrawing group um, increases the bioavailability. So in each of these compounds... Um, well, norfloxacin is only second generation, doesn't really matter. Um, Cipro, second generation, doesn't really work. Um, levofloxacin, um, there's no N right here, but attached to it from a protein standpoint, they're pretty much at the same distance. Um, oxygen is an electron withdrawing group, pretty much like nitrogen. So this increases the electro, uh, the, this increases the bioavailability. Moxifloxacin has an oxygen right here. Pretty much close to the where it should an end should be from a protein standpoint because they're basically the same distance. So oxygen at the bottom right here increases the bioavailability. Um, cool thing, moxifloxacin. It's called moxifloxacin because methoxy. You can see a methoxy right here. Sounds like moxy, flox, moxy over here. So moxifloxacin gets its name from the methoxy group right here. Cool thing, right? Okay, just to review the structure activity relationships, um, carbon six, add a fluorine, you increase the lipophilicity. Carbon seven, add a piperazine ring, ink broaden the spectrum activity. But you also increase the CNS side effects because it binds to the GABA receptors. So you can do this by adding methyl ethyl groups at the left side or bulky groups at the bottom of the molecule at R one. Um, the uh. Over here, where the X should be, um, at the phenol ring, the ring with resonance. If you add a nitrogen or any withdraw electron withdrawing group at this position or close to this position, because from a protein standpoint, they're basically the same position, you increase the bioavailability. And remember, this right side, this right ring, is the required pharmacophore. And the way you can remember the fluoroquinolones from all the other structures in this exam. Um, fluoroquinolones, quin rhymes with twin. You have twin rings right here. Two rings. None of the other structures have two rings. I can pretty much trust me, hopefully. I think I trust myself. Anyways, um, quin rhymes with twin. Fluoroquinolones has twin rings twin rings and fluoroquinolones. Okay, so bacteria have developed a few resistance mechanisms to the fluoroquinolones. Um, for example, they mutated TOPO2 enzymes. TOPO2 enzy enzymes include DNA gyrus and TOPO4, remember that. And if you mutate the TOPO2, you alter the drug binding site. If you alter the drug binding site, the drug can't bind and you can't inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. QNR gene um, is a gene that codes for a protein that displaces the drug. Remember from my last video that displacing the drug um, moves the drug away from the binding site and therefore the drug can't act on the ribosome or wherever it's acting. Q Kep -A QEP -A gene uh, creates an efflux pump. I remember this because pump starts with P. QEP has a P in it, so P and QEPA corresponds to the efflux pump. And you know what efflux pumps do if you watch my last video. Or if you just know what efflux pumps do. I'm not going to explain it again. 
Um, A A C six I B C R G. I think that's how you see it. Um, it comes from a protein that acylates the drug. I remember this because A C starts is the beginning letters of acylate. So acylate starts with A C A A C six I B C R G. And codes for a protein that acylates the drug. Okay, so the way main way that nucleotide synthesis inhibitors work is by inhibiting this main pathway where deoxyuridine is converted to deoxythymidine by thymidylate synthase and this happens when through the conversion of tetrahydrofolate or which is the same as tetrahydrofolic acid is converted to dihydrofolate which is the same as dihydrofolic acid so the main mechanism by which nucleotide synthesis inhibitors work is by inhibiting the synthesis of tetrahydrofolate, which I'll show you later. And if you, in, if you disrupt THF synthesis, you stop deoxyuridine from being converted to deoxythymidine, and then you disrupt DNA synthesis because you need deoxythymidines to form your bases, like HCGT, which is thymidine. Okay, so tetrahydrofolate is synthesized differently in both humans and bacteria. In humans, they, tetrahydrofolate is first produced by uptake of folic acid. So humans don't make their own THF completely. They have to uptake folic acid. And folic, <laughs> folic acid is converted to dihydrofolate by dihydrofolate reductase. Dihydrofolate reductase, yeah. And dihydrofolate is converted to THF by dihydrofolate reductase again. In bacteria, this is different because bacteria make their own THF completely. So what they do is take they take dihydroteroate diphosphate and paraminobenzoic acid or PABA, and they convert it to dihydroteroate by dihydroteroate synthase. Importantly, dihydroteroate synthase has no human ortholog. So this is how uh, sulfamethoxazole has selectivity in bacteria for humans is because is because they have um, bacteria or humans have no ortholog or no similar dihydroteroate synthase. Um, so dihydroteroate diphosphate and paraminobenzoic acid or PABA is converted to dihydroteroate by dihydroteroate synthase, and dihydroteroate is then converted to dihydrofolate by dihydrofolate synthetase. And dihydrofolate is converted to dihydrofolate reduct or THF by dihydrofolate reductase. Um, these red mean that sulfamethoxazole inhibits dihydroteroate synthase, and trimethoprim inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, which I'll discuss later. Um, so, back to what I was saying earlier. If you inhibit THF synthesis, then you stop di deoxythymidine synthesis, and thus you stop DNA synthesis. So, if you stop THF synthesis over here, you stop deoxythymidine synthesis, and therefore you disrupt DNA synthesis, and the bacteria die. So now we're going to talk about the sulfonamides. And the way these work is that they bought, they compete with P PABA or paraminobenzoic acid, and this produces dead end metabolites, which can no longer be made to form tetrahydrofolic acid. So if you look up here in the bacterial synthesis mechanism, um, so dihydroteroate diphosphate and paraminobenzoic acid combine to form dihydroteroate. Now, so phonamides replace paraminobenzoic acid, or they compete with paraminobenzoic acid in the production of dihydroteroate. So, if you replace paraminobenzoic acid or PABA with sulfonamides, so dihydroteroate diphosphate plus sulfonamides gives you a dead end metabolite. And this dead end metabolite can't form THF. And if, if you can't form THF, you can't form deoxythymidine, and therefore you can't replicates DNA. Okay, so now onto the structure activity relationships of the sulfonamides. Okay, so the sulfonamides 
This is pretty easy. So basically adding electron withdrawing groups, so adding anything with nitrogens, oxygens, or fluorines because they're electron withdrawing, decreases the pKa closer to the paraminobenzoic acid, or PABA, which has a pKa of, forgot to write that down, So PABA has a pKa of 6.5. Now, adding, uh, adding an electron withdrawing group decreases the sulfonamide pKa to closer to 6.5. And this decreases the activity because the molecule will be more like PABA and thus will compete more effectively with PABA in producing THF or the dead metabolite. And increase or de decreasing the pKa also increases the water solubility. Um, so let's see how this is demonstrated in each of these sulfonamides. Um, notice how the sulfonamides look pretty much like PABA. They have the nitrogen here, the phenol ring here, and the oxid electron withdrawing carboxylic acid group, which is mimicked by the sulfonamide group. Sulfonamides, easy, are named so because there's a sulfonamide group. So the sulfone and the amine group make a sulfonamide. So sulfonamide groups are named because they have a sulfonamide group. Cool, right? Um, okay, so this sulfonamide is pKa of 10.4 because it has not many electron withdrawing, withdrawing groups. But if you add an electron withdrawing group here, two nitrogens and a resonance ring. So basically two nitrogens, you get a, PK, a lower pK of 6.5, which is pretty much like PABA. But let's increase the activity even more. Um, sulfamethoxazole right here has a pK of 5.6 um, because it has an even more acidic ring over here, a more electron drying ring over here. Um, with two with nitrogen and a more electron withdrawing oxygen over here. Um, this is pretty identical to a pKa of 5.4, which is identical to a similar to a pKa of 5.6, because um, you have nitrogen, and you have an oxygen right here. So basically, what he wants to get, what Dr. Ellis wants to get out of this, is adding electron withdrawing groups. Either it'd be nitrogen, oxygens, or different bonded oxygens. Decreases the pKa, and this de increases the similarity of the sulfonamide to a pKa of 6.5 of PABA. This de and this de increases the activity of the molecule in competing against PABA, and you also increase the water solubility. Okay, so two ways that bacteria have developed sulfonamide resistance is bar one, decreasing the sensitivity of dihydroteroid synthesis to sulfonamides. So going back to the bacterial mechanism, if you decrease the sensitivity of the enzyme that converts dihydroteroid diphosphate and PABA to dihydroteroid, so if you decrease the sensitivity of that enzyme that converts this process, then you decrease sulfonamide activity because sulfonamides act on this enzyme or this process right here, which involves that hydroteroid synthase. Um, number two, resistance, me resistance mechanism. If you increase production of PABA, you decrease sulfonamide binding. Because, makes sense, because if you increase the amount of PABA, you overcome sulfonamide activity, you overcome, overcome sulfonamide com competition, and thus you make, make DNA again. So, remember that trimethoprim is another nucleotide synthesis inhibitor, and this works by inhibiting dihydrofolate. Um, so over here, where are we? Oh man. Um, dihydrofolate reductase, no, yeah, it inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. Over here, like I labeled, trimethoprim inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. Um, so it's a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, and it's different, bacterial DHFR is different enough from humans to convey selectivity. So D, uh, trimethoprim won't really act on human DHFR, and therefore you have bacterial selectivity.
So two ways that bacteria have developed resistance against trimethoprim. By one, mutating the DHFR enzyme. Um, at the isoleucine 100 leucine residues, so mutating this isoleucine 100 leucine residues has decreased the binding of um, DHFR to trimethoprim. You could, bacteria have also overexpressed the DHFR enzyme because if you overexpress, if you make more enzyme that bacteria are trying to stop, then you overcome this inhibition of trimethoprim against DHFR overcome this resistance, then you have DHFR functioning again, then you can produce tetrahydrofolic acid again, and you can produce dideoxythymidine again, and to produce DNA again. Last thing, I swear for this exam. Um, so trimethoprim and sulfonamethoxazole or other, or other sulfonamides are usually given together and this acts synergistically to basically really stop THF or tetrahydrofolate, redu tetrahydrofolate, tetrahydrofolate production. So giving these two drugs together gives you synergism to really stop THF production, to stop deoxythymidine, synth deoxythymidine synthesis, and this really stops DNA synthesis. Um... So last thing, here's a table I made for the different resistance mechanisms for each of these drug classes. I talked about it in this video. Feel free to go over it yourself. Um, notice how I color colored everything green here, green here, red here, red here. You'll see why if you really look at it. Um, now let's review. I'm finally done. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, let's see. From the top. Wow, this is longer than I thought. Um, so quinolones or photoquinolones inhibit DNA repl replication and topology by targeting topo 2, which includes DNA gyrosine topo isomerase 4. And the way they do this is by binding to the DNA, gy DNA gyrase complex, which pushes the bases apart and prevents religation and prevents DNA release. Um, let's see, they're selective because human top... Human topo 2 is different enough from bacterial topo 2. Um, for loquinolones, remember the carbon 6 has a fluorine, carbon 7 has a piperazine, um, nitrogen at the bottom increases bioavailability, um, fluorine at carbon 6 increases bioavailability, bioavailability by increasing lipophilicity, piperazine ring here. Also increases, also leads to CNS side effects, which can be lessened by adding methyl or ethyl groups at the left, or bulky groups at the bottom, or one group. Required pharmacophore is the right side ring. Um, let's see. Um, resistance mechanisms, don't want to talk about that. Um, nucleotide synthesis inhibitors. Um, these work by inhibiting tetrahydrofolate, which inhibits deoxythymidine synthesis synthesis which inhibits DNA synthesis. Um, human synthesis has a different pathway than bacterial synthesis. Some of the thoxazole acts by competing against PAB and acting on dihydroteroid synthesis synthase path pathway. And remember that dihydro dihydroteroid synthase has no human ortholog. So human dihydroteroid synthase synthase and bacterial di di dihydroteroid synthesis are not very similar, which leads to selectivity. Trimethoprim acts at dihydrofolate reductase. Um, sulfonamide produces dead end metabolites by competing against PABA. Structure active relationships of sulfonamides. They, by adding electron withdrawing group, you get the PKA closer to PABA, which increases activity because it's pretty much um, the same as PABA, especially since they're really structurally, structurally related. And this also increases the water solubility. Um, resistance mechanism, trimethoprim, it's a DHFR, dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, um, blah, blah, combination therapy, where sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim, or sulfonamides and trimethoprim are usually given together for a synergism. Thank God I'm done. Um, if you have any comments, 
after this video or after these two videos, always feel free to leave them at uh, polev.com slash christianrui629. Um, remember, rate it five star, one to five stars, or give it a rating of one to five. One means ten out of ten, but not watch again. <laughs> that rhymes. Um, five means A plus, good job, but watch again. If you have specific comments, comments about any of the videos I made, be sure to mention or yeah, n n name the specific video. I always take both positive and constructive feedback. Um, as you see for the as you seen from the last few videos, I love feedback. Feedback feedback always make, always makes things better. Anyways, it's been a long three hours making these videos, but hope you enjoy them and good luck on the exam.